As the Russian invasion of Ukraine continues grinding through its second year, both sides are beginning to run low on their supplies of everything, from manpower to weapons and to ammunition that they require to continue fighting. The most recent estimate from the United States in regards to the casualties suffered during Europe's biggest war since 1945 are absolutely horrendous. They believe that as of September 2023, the Russian casualties since the invasion began are fast approaching 300,000, divided between as many as 120,000 Russian soldiers killed in action, and as many as another 180,000 more wounded. These U.S. estimated losses on the Russian side are significantly higher than the U.S. estimated casualty figures for the Ukrainian side, however, which are believed to currently stand at around 190,000 total casualties, divided between an estimated 70,000 Ukrainian soldiers killed in action and another 120,000 more wounded. This makes for a total military casualty figure in the war only 19 months in, approaching a total of 500,000 when combining both sides as totals, including nearly 200,000 soldiers who have been killed in action. And that's without factoring in any of the estimated loss in life to Ukrainian civilians, which the United Nations estimates to also be somewhere in the ballpark of the tens of thousands. This all easily makes the Russian invasion of Ukraine the bloodiest conflict seen in Europe since the Second World War, having already in less than two years eclipsed the total number of deaths experienced throughout the entire Yugoslav Wars that lasted for a decade between 1991 and 2001 with the Ukrainian side alone having already suffered higher losses than the United States did during nearly 20 years in Vietnam, and with the Russian side alone having suffered more than double the losses of the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, which ultimately culminated in a revolution in the country. In the first two weeks alone of Ukraine's massive counteroffensive that began in June of 2023, the United States estimated that as much as 20% of all the weapons and equipment that Ukraine sent into battle was either destroyed or damaged. And the sheer scale of death and destruction that has been wrought in Ukraine on both sides during this war is reflective of the sheer volume of lethal weapons and munitions that both sides have been firing at each other. It has been estimated by U.S. analysts that the Russian side in the war fired somewhere between 10 and 11 million rounds of artillery on the Ukrainian battlefield across 2022 alone, to say nothing of how much they fired in 2023. On some days, according to the same American estimates, the Russians have been capable of maintaining a pace of firing between 20,000 and 50,000 rounds of artillery in Ukraine every single day, while the Ukrainians have only been managing to fire back at a rate of somewhere between 4,000 and 7,000 shells of artillery a day. And after having kept these rates of fire up for 19 months now, both sides have burned through millions of rounds of artillery and small arms ammunition and both sides' inventories and stockpiles of each are beginning to run low. And so, both sides have begun searching abroad beyond their own countries for newer sources to keep their guns supplied and firing long enough to last until the other side runs out first. And there is no larger source of stockpiled artillery shells and ammunition just sitting there unused in inventories anywhere in the world than on the Korean Peninsula, where North Korea and South Korea have remained officially at war with one another for more than 70 years ever since the signing of a ceasefire agreement back in 1953, which ended the shooting between them but never officially ended the state of war between them. For decades, both the United States and Russia in its previous form, the Soviet Union, poured enormous amounts of weapons and ammunition into the hands of their respectively backed sides. The United States poured their weapons into South Korea while the Soviets poured their weapons into North Korea, as the fear on both sides of another hot war erupting on the Korean Peninsula between them remained ever-present. When the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union ended in the early 1990s, it never really ended at all in the Korean Peninsula and tensions remained extremely high through to the present, with both sides remaining prepared for the possibility of an all-out war resuming again, and with both sides having never winded down their vast stockpiles of artillery, rockets, ammunition, and guns built up over the decades preparing for it. As a result, the North and the South continue to possess what are literally the largest stockpiles of artillery shells and small arms ammunition that can be found anywhere in the entire world, with likely several tens of millions of rounds of artillery sitting there apiece. North Korea, in particular, is likely home to the single largest artillery arsenal of any of the world's countries, with at least 10,000 artillery systems that are more than every single country in NATO combined, and with tens of millions of their own artillery shells stockpiled up for a war with the South and the United States that, for the past 70 years so far, has still never come. 
North Korea may be a highly impoverished country with meager economic and technological power, but it has consistently over decades prioritized its military and armed forces above all other concerns of the state. With its regime constantly warning against an imminent U.S. invasion and urging the need for constant militaristic vigilance. Prior to the country developing and acquiring nuclear weapons, North Korea's greatest deterrent they had to dissuade against an invasion from the U.S. and South Korea was its close relations with the Soviet Union and China, and above all, its massive and formidable military and artillery apparatus. North Korea, you see, has maintained compulsory military conscription in the country for all men for a period of at least 10 years, between the ages of 17 and 30, while North Korean women are selectively conscripted for military service as well until the age of 23 making North Korea easily the most heavily militarized society in the world in the 21st century, where at any given time roughly one in three people in the country are an active member of one of the nation's various military and paramilitary organizations. In terms of total numbers of soldiers in active military, reserve military, and paramilitary roles combined, North Korea literally has the largest armed forces in the world, with nearly 8 million total soldiers it can call upon and field quickly during a conflict significantly more than countries with way larger populations than it, like China, Russia, or the United States. The country with the second largest total armed forces it can quickly call upon, naturally, is South Korea, with a total of about 6.7 million total personnel it can call upon in the event of a conflict. And beyond the sheer enormity of North Korea's potential manpower base to pull from during a conflict, the other component of the country's deterrence historically was their massive investment into their artillery arsenal. A recent report from the RAND Corporation in 2020 concluded that North Korea continues to maintain around 6,000 of their total artillery systems near to the DMZ border with South Korea, within range of the very densely populated South Korean capital and largest city, Seoul the metropolitan region of which is home to more than 26 million people today, or about half of South Korea's entire population. That 2020 era report concluded that within the opening hour of a full-scale hot war resuming on the Korean peninsula, North Korea's artillery systems along the DMZ could unleash what they've previously referred to as the Sea of Fire upon Seoul and the metropolitan area surrounding it, and in the process, kill upwards of 200,000 people in only a single hour through only conventional artillery without even resorting to their large chemical or nuclear weapons arsenals. That is high enough of a possible carnage to make any U.S. president think twice about attacking the North. And so, this was what North Korea primarily relied upon for deterrence for decades. But then in the 2000s, they realized that that still might not actually be enough. Saddam Hussein's Iraq, which was conventionally formidable on paper with nearly 400,000 standing troops, 2,000 tanks, 2,300 artillery systems, 300 combat aircraft, and 4,000 anti-air guns was almost casually swept aside in little more than a month by the vastly conventionally and technologically superior US and UK forces who invaded Iraq in 2003, with only 196 coalition troops losing their lives compared to around 30,000 Iraqi troops. The primary justification that the US and UK had used to invade Iraq in 2003 was Saddam Hussein's possession of weapons of mass destruction and his nuclear weapons program, something that it turned out Iraq didn't actually have, which is what ultimately left them vulnerable to a U.S. invasion. North Korea saw the writing on the wall and feared that they could become the target of the next U.S. invasion. So in the buildup to the invasion of Iraq, they decided to formally withdraw from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which they had previously agreed to sign back in 1985, becoming, to date, the only country that has ever signed the treaty and then later withdrew from it. Almost immediately afterwards, North Korea resumed its nuclear weapons program, which culminated with their first successful test of a crude atomic bomb in 2006, and which eventually led to the current estimated arsenal of around four nuclear warheads, along with their increasingly sophisticated missile program designed to deliver those warheads to targets very far away from North Korea. The nukes and the missiles thus began adding to North Korea's level of deterrence against a U.S. invasion or intervention, spurred on even further after witnessing major U.S. military interventions against Gaddafi's Libya in 2011 and against the Assad regime in Syria in 2017 and 2018. But North Korea's nuclear weapons served another purpose to the Kim regime besides simply deterrence. They also served as a potential bargaining chip to try and get the United States to negotiate and compromise with them in order to ultimately get rid of them. 
You see, for decades following the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, North Korea pursued a policy of attempted normalization with the United States instead, since they had just lost their primary supporter and benefactor and were attempting to break free from an increasingly assertive and overbearing China. Between 2012 and 2019, during Kim Jong-un's early years in power in Pyongyang, the North frequently made attempts at securing security guarantees and assurances from the United States and improving relations in exchange for addressing their nuclear weapons program. This policy culminated with the first meeting between then-U.S. President Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un in Singapore in 2018, the very first time ever in history that the American and North Korean heads of state visited each other face-to-face, -face, followed up by a second meeting between them the following year in February of 2019 in Hanoi, Vietnam. It was this second meeting between them in particular that went poorly, with Trump abruptly cutting the meeting short and saying that no agreement or compromise could be reached. Leading up to the meeting, the United States Senate had passed a clause which declared that the winding down of America's 22,000 troops deployed to South Korea was a non-negotiable item. Trump claimed that North Korea had requested an end to all U.S. sanctions on their country in exchange for surrendering their nuclear weapons, while the North's foreign minister conversely insisted that they had only requested a partial lifting of sanctions in exchange for beginning to wind down their nuclear program. Either way, Trump left the meeting without reaching any kind of deal with Kim, and Kim likely ended up feeling that Trump had rejected his offer. It was after that that North Korea started distancing itself and became unengaged with Washington, hardly answering the phone or communicating with the United States at all in an apparent reassessment of its 30-year-long and failed policy of trying to normalize relations. After the chaotic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in July of 2021, North Korea possibly began believing that the United States was on the decline and began making clear signs that it was firmly realigning itself with its old Cold War-era allies once again, Moscow and Beijing. Before the year had even ended, North Korea's government expressed support for the Russian claims to the Kuril Islands, which are disputed with Japan, and further directly linked the controversy around Taiwan with the potential of triggering a resumption of the war in Korea. The final nail in the coffin for any hope of resumed negotiations between Washington and Pyongyang took place shortly after the Russian invasion of Ukraine in March of 2022, when North Korea resumed testing and launching of its ICBMs that are capable of striking the U.S. mainland something that they had previously committed to not doing back in 2018 four years beforehand. During the negotiations with the Trump administration, North Korea would end up breaking its own record in 2022 for the most missiles it has ever launched in a single year. More than 70 of them, including a missile in October that flew over the Japanese main island of Honshu. After Russia unilaterally declared that it was annexing the Ukrainian provinces of Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson into their country in September of 2022, North Korea further became one of the only countries in the world to ever recognize the Russian claims, the only other to date being Bashar al-Assad, Syria. And now in 2023, in an incredibly ironic twist of history and circumstance, it is the Russians and the Americans alike who are both coming back to their respective historically supported sides in the Korean Peninsula, asking for some of their previously gifted arms back in order to fight in another conflict, raging on the other side of Eurasia and Ukraine. And both North and South Korea have been cooperating with them to a certain extent, transforming the war in Ukraine into a sort of proxy battlefield between the two Korean arch-rivals. Back in 2019, Vladimir Putin met with Kim Jong-un for the first time in their lives. Back then, it was Kim who was desperate for any kind of diplomatic lifeline with the outside world, after having just failed to reach that deal with Trump during the summit in Hanoi. And Putin was trying to position himself to become the great mediator between the Kim regime and Washington for further negotiations on denuclearization. But today, just four years later after that first meeting between Putin and Kim, the geopolitical reality in 2023 is vastly different. Now it is Russia who is increasingly becoming more and more isolated from the international community, owing to its massive invasion of Ukraine. With nearly every single country in Europe, plus the United States, Canada, the Bahamas, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea having levied financial sanctions against Moscow and earning themselves a place on Russia's so-called list of unfriendly countries. Putin himself can also hardly travel anywhere in the world beyond Russia's own borders now, because of an arrest warrant that was issued for him by the International Criminal Court, or ICC, in The Hague on the 17th of March 2023, over alleged war crimes taking place during the invasion of Ukraine. As of the production of this video, Putin himself has not left the borders of Russia ever since the arrest warrant was made, though he does have a planned visit to China shortly who does not recognize the ICC's authority. 
All of this isolation that Putin and Russia alike are increasingly facing on the world stage has been pushing Putin to begin adopting a new, post-Western foreign policy for Russia, in search of new allies who are similarly opposed to the Western-led world order, and who will help him both diplomatically and militarily in Ukraine. The problem with that is that there aren't many of those around who are willing to stick out their necks for him. China, perhaps Russia's greatest supporter of all diplomatically and economically, has been hardly supportive at all militarily so far, having apparently only sent the Russians a mere 100,000 bulletproof vests and helmets since the invasion began. There are very few countries who are willing to support the Russians militarily and run afoul of influential Western financial sanctions, as the countries who are currently sanctioning Russia collectively represent nearly 60% of the entire global economy. And so supporting Russia militarily would mean being sanctioned and getting locked out of that same 60% of the global economy. Thus, when it comes to countries who have given military aid to Ukraine during the war, the list is vast and includes dozens of countries from all across the world, including a whopping $44 billion worth of military aid given by the United States alone. The Russians have gained no such international military support anywhere near the same kind of scale, and that has forced the Russians to basically only being able to go to other fellow pariah states, who are already under heavy Western financial sanctions and who thus don't really have anything more to lose than they already have, by choosing to help the Russians militarily, such as Iran, and now, North Korea as well. The Russians are known to have previously acquired thousands of Iranian-produced Shahed drones for use against Ukraine since the invasion began, while the Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is known to have personnel within the Russian-occupied parts of Ukraine assisting the Russians with the operation and further manufacturing of these drones. And then, suddenly, in July of 2023, the Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu made an official state visit to Pyongyang in North Korea, becoming the very first Russian defense minister to ever visit the country since the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was obvious that the Russians desired access to the tens of millions of artillery shells that were sitting there unused in North Korea's vast arsenal. Shells that were entirely based off of Soviet-era designs that are easily mutually compatible with the artillery systems that the Russians are currently using in Ukraine. North Korea's arsenal is almost certainly the largest ready-to-use stockpile of artillery that the Russians can easily use in Ukraine that can be found anywhere in the world outside of Russia's own borders. If the Russians could gain access to it, it would mean that North Korea could hypothetically supply the Russians with literally millions of rounds of artillery from these stockpiles and keep the Russian guns in Ukraine firing at full volume for at least another one or two years, and perhaps even longer than that. Especially when considering North Korea's potential to manufacture even further artillery rounds for the Russian war machine. Having been completely and singularly focused on being prepared for total war for 70 years, North Korea runs a vast network of munitions factories within the country, including at least 100 different factories dedicated to munitions assembly, which collectively employ around 1 million North Korean laborers, or about 4% of the entire North Korean population strictly dedicated to building munitions. North Korea also has good rail and sea links directly with the bordering Russian Far East, meaning that North Korea could essentially serve as a very significant rear base of supplies for the Russian war machine in Ukraine, providing millions of rounds of stockpiled artillery in addition to rockets and small arms ammunition for the Russians to carry across their whole country towards the military front line in Ukraine. A rear base that also cannot easily be interfered with, not only because of its sheer distance away from the front line, but also because of North Korea's remaining nuclear weapons arsenal, and their ability and willingness to massively retaliate. Moreover, North Korea potentially came to the conclusion on their own that without the possibility for any further diplomacy or negotiations with the United States, and no hope of normalized relations with them, their nuclear arsenal was never going to go anywhere, because it will never end up being used as a bargaining chip to try and improve relations and reduce sanctions. Meaning that their only remaining purpose is strictly for deterrence. And since they will always have the nukes for deterrence, they don't really need as much of their earlier deterrent that they were using before the nukes. Their massive artillery arsenal and sea of fire that could obliterate Seoul within an hour, which they can now safely exchange with the Russians for things that they actually do need right now. Naturally, in exchange for giving the Russians millions of rounds of their artillery, the North Koreans are going to want things in return. 
North Korea has been completely shut down and isolated from the rest of the outside world ever since January of 2020, during a self-imposed and extremely strictly enforced quarantine over the COVID-19 pandemic in which extensive new border fortifications have been constructed all along the northern frontiers with China and Russia, and shoot-to-kill orders were given to all border guards for anyone caught trying to enter or leave the country from any direction, an order that has remained in force for over three years now. This severely cut down on the numbers of defectors successfully escaping from North Korea, as well as the volume of illicit smuggled foreign contraband getting into North Korea like hard drives, books, and SD cards. But it also severely cut down on North Korea's critical imports of things like food, spare parts, and fuel, which have all evidently become a scarcity within the Hermit Kingdom once again. So North Korea wants food, spare parts, and energy resources from the Russians at a bare minimum. They also want Russia to drop their sanctions on North Korea and resume normal trade relations. And they also want the Russians to help them circumvent their own financial sanctions that are being imposed by the West, in a growing, sort of underground trade network between the world's most heavily sanctioned countries. Russia, North Korea, Iran, Syria, and Belarus. Further, they perhaps also want the Russians to provide them with even more things as well, such as more advanced fighter aircraft like the modern Russian-produced Su-35 and Su-57, both of which the Russians have recently been struggling to sell to any customers abroad, and which from Moscow's perspective could be better to at least trade with North Korea for something rather than sitting around and doing nothing. The Russians could even help the North Koreans tremendously by only providing them with slightly older and less capable fighters than the modern cutting-edge ones, considering that the North Korean Air Force right now is incredibly outdated, and largely consists of fighters and ground attack craft like the MiG-29 and the Su-25 Frogfoot that began production back in 1981 and 1978 respectively, more than four decades ago. The North Koreans might even simply be satisfied with receiving aviation spare parts to keep these old aircraft running. They also might want advanced Russian anti-air systems to better defend their nuclear missile launch sites from possible American or South Korean air attacks, such as the S-300 or S-400 Russian-built systems. And then, potentially getting a little more demandy, the North may also be interested in acquiring highly sensitive Russian nuclear submarine technology, submarine-launched ballistic missile technology, or even more advanced rocket and missile propulsion and evasion technology to assist them further with their own reconnaissance satellite program in perfecting their ICBM's range and ability to break through Western anti-air systems. These latter items, though, are perhaps things that the Russians will still be highly reluctant to give to the North Koreans simply in exchange for mere conventional and unguided artillery, rockets, and small arms ammunition. Especially not when Russia could get away with trading some of their abundant and cheap oil and gas for them instead, or looted grains that they've pillaged from Ukraine and transported over effectively for free. And as a permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, Russia could also offer North Korea substantially further diplomatic support at the UN as well which, to an extent, has already been taking place since the invasion began. Ever since 2019, Russia has consistently rejected any new sanctions being slapped on North Korea by the UN. And in 2022, Moscow wouldn't even support a UN statement condemning North Korea for its launching of ICBMs. North Korea could easily depend on further Russian diplomatic protection at the UN like this, and potentially even count on a full-on de facto normalization of relations with Russia, akin to how things used to be back during the Cold War Soviet era. Maybe not as ideal as a normalization with the United States, but from Pyongyang, perspective, better Moscow than nothing. Regardless, both Russia and North Korea clearly have a lot to offer each other right now, and sure enough, in September of 2023, Kim Jong-un himself took the decision to finally leave his country for the first time in four years by getting aboard his personal armored train and steaming across the border into the Russian Far East to meet directly with Vladimir Putin face to face for the second ever time in their lives to discuss the terms of a potential deal like this. Afterwards, Putin and Kim even agreed that Putin himself would personally come down to North Korea next and visit Pyongyang at an undetermined future date. The first time that Putin will visit the country since the last time he did 23 years previously, all the way back in 2000, shortly after he first assumed power in Russia and met with Kim Jong-un's father, Kim Jong-il. 
Now, the U.S. has been accusing the North Koreans of providing the Russians with weapons ever since 2022, but these had always been believed to be low, fairly insignificant volumes. The North was keen to put on an air of plausible deniability out of the fear of escalating tensions further with South Korea and the U.S. at home on the Korean Peninsula, while the Russians were likely attempting to test drive the North Korean stockpiles to see if they actually worked well enough to their satisfaction. You see, there has been a very high degree of uncertainty over the quality of North Korea's massive munition stockpiles for decades. Most of their artillery shells are dumb, unguided ones that were largely manufactured decades ago back in the 1980s and 1990s. Back in 2010, the South Koreans carried out an artillery exercise in waters that North Korea claimed were their own territorial waters. In retaliation, North Korean artillery guns opened fire on the populated South Korean island of Yonpyeong, firing a total of around 170 shells and killing four people in the process. According to a later report on the incident produced by the Washington-based 38 North Project, more than half of the artillery rounds fired by the North Koreans during that attack missed their target completely and landed in the waters around the island, while a further one in five of the artillery shells that hit the island failed to even explode. This was a very high failure rate, and it suggested that at least some North Korean-produced artillery shells suffered from either poor storage conditions and standards, or subpar quality control during their manufacturing process, or potentially even a combination of both. The Russians had to be aware of this potential risk, that a lot of the North Korean artillery shells could, in fact, be lemons. But they also don't really have any other possible alternative to choose from right now for sourcing more artillery rounds to keep on fighting. But even if most of the North Korean artillery shells performed as they did in 2010 at Yonpyeong, if the Russians acquired 10 million rounds of North Korean artillery to fire in Ukraine, and one in five of them failed to explode, that's still 8 million rounds of artillery that won't fail, and will still be devastating to a high degree. Whatever discussions Putin and Kim had directly face-to-face -face in Russia in September, the terms will likely not ever be made public over the sensitivities of both sides involved. Russia itself has signed off on multiple previous UN Security Council resolutions sanctioning North Korea over its nuclear weapons program and has even agreed to place arms embargoes on the country, which, trading some advanced Russian military technology for millions of rounds of artillery and small arms ammunition, would obviously and grossly violate placing Russia in even further major diplomatic hot water around the world than it already is in. Further, the North hypothetically acquiring more advanced Russian military technology in the forms of potential current-gen fighters, submarines, or even improved satellites, rockets, and missiles would greatly alarm the government in South Korea, and potentially even further incentivize the hawks in Seoul to dramatically step up their military support for Ukraine much more than they already have. Which would be quite terrible news for Russia. You see, just like North Korea, the South has also been preparing itself to guard against another full-scale war erupting on the Korean Peninsula for the past 70 years, and in the process, they have developed a very large military industrial base and have steadily emerged as one of the world's most significant arms exporters. Dramatically more technologically advanced and wealthier than North Korea is, with an economy that is these days approaching the size of Russia itself despite only having a third of their population, South Korea has managed to carve out a highly influential niche for itself in the global arms industry in what is called the mid-level segment, consisting of things like tanks, artillery, and armored vehicles. For example, the South Korean-produced K9 Thunder self-propelled howitzer designed by Kia and Samsung absolutely dominates the global market for its class, having accounted for a total of 52% of the global self-propelled howitzer export market ever since 2000. And ever since 2000, South Korea has steadily expanded its overall share of the global arms export market, and since 2017, it has experienced the fastest growing market share of any country in the world, to the point where it eventually cracked into the top 10 arms exporting countries in the world for the first time in 2019, and then rose to the number 8 position by 2021. And then, in 2022, amidst the war in Ukraine, South Korea's arms exports exploded by a whopping 140% to never-before-seen heights of nearly $18 billion, including highly lucrative contracts signed with the UAE and Egypt, and a single massive $12.4 billion contract they signed with Poland to provide the Polish armed forces with South Korean-built artillery, fighters, and tanks that will replace most of the outdated Soviet-era equipment that the Poles have gifted to Ukraine. The current South Korean administration of Yoon Suk-yul has sworn to continue full steam ahead until South Korea is the fourth largest arms exporter in the world by 2027, remaining only behind the United States, Russia, and France by then. 
But knowing all of this, the Russian government has repeatedly warned South Korea against directly supplying any of their large amounts of arms directly to Ukraine, and has threatened to retaliate by providing further military assistance to North Korea if they ever did so. That has understandably made South Korea fairly hesitant to actually provide Ukraine with any lethal military aid directly so far. But that hasn't stopped the United States, who is South Korea's most strategically important ally, from continually pressuring them to do so anyway and open up their similarly massive artillery inventories to the Ukrainians. Thus, it is known that South Korea and the United States worked out a sort of compromise to get around South Korea's hesitancy to do so directly. The United States would empty out their own stockpiles of artillery shells and give them to Ukraine, and then South Korea would either sell or lend their artillery shells to the Americans in order to replace them with an ironclad clause baked in that South Korean-produced munitions would stay within the United States and not ever be transferred any further to Ukraine. This is highly similar to how Poland transferred large volumes of its old Soviet-era gear to the Ukrainians, and then purchased large volumes of South Korean-produced arms to replace them, with a similar clause that was baked into that agreement that the South Korean-produced gear would stay within Poland and not ever be transferred any further to Ukraine. These loopholes have enabled South Korea to sort of indirectly support the war effort in Ukraine anyway, by helping to refill the munitions inventories of all of its allies, who are the ones actually sending their own weapons to Ukraine directly. And understandably, South Korea treats the exact quantity of munitions that it has stocked away in its arsenal as a very closely guarded top secret of the state. So nobody really knows exactly how many artillery rounds that has transferred to the United States since the invasion of Ukraine began, but estimates thrown around by analysts believe that it's somewhere in the ballpark of several hundred thousand already. However, if it turned out that the Russians were buying up millions of artillery rounds for North Korea and providing Pyongyang with more advanced technology and assisting with their weapons and missile programs anyway, then South Korea would have no remaining incentive to continue only supporting Ukraine indirectly like this, and they would have nothing to lose by unleashing their massive and still growing arms industry into the hands of the Ukrainians to push back against the Russians with full force. Meaning that in this scenario, large volumes of South Korean weapons would be going directly up against large volumes of North Korean weapons across the battlefield in Ukraine, turning the war into a sort of Korean proxy conflict. And moreover, with a hypothetically more militarily advanced and capable North Korea with more advanced Russian technology, South Korea, as well as maybe Japan, would become dramatically more persistent with Washington into allowing them to develop their own nuclear weapons arsenals as well. The issue is already particularly acute within South Korea. The current president, Yoon suk yeol plainly stated back in 2021, before global tensions skyrocketed to where they are today, that he was going to ask the United States to redeploy tactical nuclear weapons to South Korea. Korea, which the United States had withdrawn from the Korean Peninsula 30 years previously back in 1991, during the closing days of the Cold War. Yoon suk yeol further recently stated in January of 2023 that if his country's security situation regarding the threat posed by North Korean weapons deteriorated any further, that South Korea would consider breaking the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty as well, and develop their own nuclear weapons arsenal were the United States to refuse redeploying their nukes to South Korea. South Korea has the technology and the skills to likely be capable of producing a nuclear weapon in less than a year's time, and they already have the means to deliver a warhead sitting idly by. South Korea is so far the only country in the world who doesn't yet have nuclear weapons, but has managed to develop submarine-launched ballistic missiles, meaning that were they to develop nuclear weapons, they could easily and rapidly arm their submarines with them, and so quickly possess a sea-based nuclear deterrent just like great powers do, like the United States or Russia. The move to do so is already very popular with the South Korean public. As recent polling data has shown, that more than 70% of South Koreans support their country developing their own independent nuclear weapons arsenal and deterrent. That already high percentage would almost certainly rise even higher and become a fever pitch if it turned out that the Russians were supplying the North with more advanced and capable military technology. And then, if South Korea suddenly developed their own nuclear weapons arsenal or American nuclear weapons came back to South Korea like during the Cold War, that would almost certainly terrify and outrage China, who would become increasingly concerned about American nuclear weapons nearby on their doorstep and or the increased possibility of a full-scale nuclear war erupting on the Korean Peninsula between South and North that could easily escalate and impact themselves as well. Beijing would be even further concerned about the proliferation of nuclear weapons into South Korea spreading further in their neighborhood, to Japan or, worst of all, to Taiwan 
who, with a nuclear deterrent, could easily threaten to catastrophically punish any Chinese attempt at invasion and forceful reunification. China would be highly aware about all of these potential undesirable outcomes, with the Russians and North Koreans exchanging artillery for technology right beneath their noses. Meaning that China would almost certainly be opposed to any kind of deal between Moscow and Pyongyang with those kinds of terms. Which means that Putin and Kim alike are going to be even further incentivized to try and keep the exact terms of any deal they come up with a top secret. It's also why Russia may end up only being willing to trade energy, food, spare parts, and diplomatic and economic support with North Korea, and will push back against trading any of the bigger ticket items like fighters, submarines, and or better rocket and missile technologies. Moscow wants to appease China and keep them as happy as possible, because China has become Russia's greatest economic lifeline as the Russians have diverted most of their oil and gas sales away from Europe. Russia needs China way, way more than China needs Russia right now. But if indeed millions of North Korean produced artillery shells and bullets begin suddenly appearing in the barrels of Russian guns across Ukraine, and North Korea's rocket, missile, satellite, fighter, and submarine programs start becoming more advanced, the world should not be terribly surprised. And the Western world should be prepared on how best to respond. Now, something that I've begun to notice about myself is that despite being a very busy person, I always seem to have small little gaps across my days that I end up filling by browsing through the recent news on Reddit, TikTok, or Twitter. And while that's fine in small doses, I also usually find myself believing that I don't have enough free time to do certain things that I really would like to do. Like learning new things, especially new complex things like STEM subjects, but there's an easy and free way to get started with this video's sponsor, Brilliant. They design these fantastic interactive courses on STEM subjects that are broken down into smaller, bite-sized chunks so you can genuinely fit learning something very useful into any schedule, from casino probability to computer science to logic and so many others. And again, the courses are legitimately well designed so that you're actually engaged the whole way through, and you actually learn stuff all along the way since they break really big concepts down into their intuitive base principles and then bring them back together again progressively as you go. I find it so satisfying to learn something new and interesting, especially when it's something that I never could have possibly imagined actually having a firm grasp on, like calculus, electricity, and magnetism, or astrophysics. Basically, if you're the kind of person who enjoys challenging yourself to learning new things, then Brilliant is definitely for you. So you should go to brilliant.org slash real life lore or click the button that's here on screen right now to try out everything that Brilliant has to offer next completely free for a full 30 days. And best of all, the first 200 people to follow that link or click that button will also get a further 20% off of Brilliant's annual premium subscription. It's a great way to help support real life lore and learn something cool at the same time. And as always, thank you so much for watching.